Well, higher education has had an important role in societies across the ages, though that role has changed very much if we look at different time periods. In, in contemporary times, it's the idea of the knowledge economy that has brought higher education to the fore. Um, and that role has been very strongly acknowledged in high-income countries, but until recently, um, it, I think it's true to say that it was considered something of a luxury in low- and middle-income countries, particularly in low-income countries. Um, after the Second World War, there was a period of um, tremendous excitement about the development of new universities, national universities, but through the 1970s, 1980s and 90s, um, the sector was really starved of resources as attention went to primary education. But there's been a real rekindling of interest in higher education in relation to international development. Um, for a range of reasons. Um, firstly, economists have revised their views around the returns to investment in higher education. Um, there's also been a realisation um, that in order to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, um, the, to provide the basic services in education, health and a range of other areas, it's important to um, develop higher education systems to train the relevant professionals. Um, and so for those reasons, governments, supranational agencies are starting to bring their attention back to the higher education se sector um, and to, to understand the, the crucial role that it has, along with primary and secondary uh, sectors, of course. There are three main activities of universities that we can see having an impact uh, in society. There's its teaching function, it's perhaps the most, the most prominent role of the university. That, developing the kinds of knowledge and skills and, and other attributes um, in, in students in their professional lives and their broader lives, their civic and personal um, development and so forth. There's the research dimension of universities, um, addressing local and national development challenges and providing solutions. And there's also the third aspect of universities that's less acknowledged, is what's often called public service or community engagement. And this relates to the range of different knowledge exchange activities um, with all sorts of communities. And in some cases, in, particularly in low-income countries, providing a very direct service to communities in terms of providing facilities and resources that, that, that communities can use. And I think it's important to point out, finally, that. Um, while governments very often emphasise the economic benefits of higher education, they very much are there. There are a range of other non-economic benefits that universities have in their societies relating to health and nutrition, to governance, human rights, gender equality and so forth. Well, I think the, the, if, if we look at trends within the higher education se sector, its massification is, is the is the, the, the most obvious trend that we can see. And this has been in response to huge demographic changes. So we've got population growth, we've also got expansion of primary secondary systems. It's meant that there are many more school leavers who are knocking on the door of the university. If we're looking in global terms, there are estimated to be 33% uh, gross enrollment rate across the whole of the world in, in, in tertiary education. Now, the way that's calculated, that doesn't, that's not equivalent to a third of school leavers going on to university because it includes um, what we might call mature students. Nevertheless, it indicates an extraordinary growth. Um, in low-income countries, that figure falls to 8%. So we're looking at a very, very uneven um, landscape here. But um, certainly, uh, the, the Demographic changes, along with the changing nature of the labour market and the increasing need for a higher education diploma, um, has been a, a, an absolutely crucial change in higher education sectors, moving from very compact elite sectors to ones which are attending to increasing proportions of the population. A, a second um, important global force that is um, having an impact on higher education is um, moves towards the market. Um, so higher education has been strongly influenced by broader influences of changes in, in political and economic thought around the role of the state and increasing attachment to the market as a way of allocating resources and, and providing services in society. 
It's also been a result of a crisis of funding for higher education, public funding, which has meant that university systems have, to a large extent, had to rely on private sources of, of, of funding to support themselves. And that's led to a range of different impacts on, on the sector. Growth of private institutions, particularly for-profit institutions, have had an enormous growth in recent years, as well as the partial privatisation of public universities, uh, cost sharing, charging of fees to students, as well as commercialisation of a range of other activities within universities, um, which has very much changed the nature of the university as an institution. Um, there are a range of other dynamics in the contemporary age. Globalisation, of course, has had a, a very strong impact on higher education as it has on every sector. Um, internationalisation of universities has been a, a key trend in recent years. It manifests itself in different ways depending on the type of country. So for some countries, it's an opportunity to generate revenue by attracting international students. For other countries, it's an opportunity to send their staff, students and staff abroad for mobility purposes that benefits through that. Um, many institutions are, are creating branch campuses, transnational provision of education. Um, uh, in addition to uh, a kind of fever around international rankings of universities, so people want to compare themselves with, with, uh, with other institutions around the world. So globalization is having a very strong impact in the sector. Um, there is a, a, a final trend that's rather more incipient, but I think is worth mentioning. That's what's sometimes called unbundling. And this is a, a, a very recent trend in higher education, which has, again, come from a, the, the business sector around the, um, the benefits, potentially, although it's very controversial, around unpackaging some of the things that we commonly associate with the university. So, um, we've seen the emergence of teaching-only institutions, taking away a lot of what you might consider to be the frills of the university experience to provide the bare minimum at a much uh, lower cost. And perhaps the most extreme example of unbundling is the emergence of MOOCs, the MOOC phenomenon, massive open online courses which um, present the delivery of content but with, with very little else. So that, that would be another um, dynamic that's just starting but could potentially be very big in the future. It has been stated that the, uh, one of the ways of understanding what a higher education system needs to be successful is a juggling of three balls simultaneously, that you need to have in the air at the same time without falling to the ground equity, quality and, and funding. And I, if, I think it's one way of, of understanding the challenges is, is in these three areas. And, and all three of them represent really significant difficulties at the moment. Um, I think most systems would be able to do one or maybe two of them at the same time, but to do all three at the same time is, is, is really difficult. And that's the case not only for low and middle income countries with severe resource constraints, but even for high income countries. I think it's fair to say that the huge expansion we've seen in, in higher education in recent years has, has mainly been an expansion for the middle class or, or the upper middle class. Um, we're not seeing a, yet a significant proportion of low income students going to universities. Um, even in high income countries there's a significant disparity between the proportions of low and, and higher income students going to universities. Um, there are also issues of gender equality in higher education. Even though globally there are more women than men in universities, that hides significant disparities in relation to discipline, disciplinary spread of those students. There are, of course, still many university, uh, sorry, many countries in which um, the proportion of women going to um, going to university is much lower. Not to mention the difficulties that, that women face when they're actually in university in terms of the, the um, their opportunities for learning and, and conversion of those opportunities. Um, conversion of that learning into opportunities in the society outside. In, in many countries, there are also, there's also significant um, barriers in terms of race and ethnicity, religion perhaps, or language or regional origin. So, uh, higher education systems are highly um, inequitable uh, all around the world, and those inequities manifest themselves in different ways depending on the country. Um, there's also a significant problem of quality. Um, 
just as was seen at the primary level, and this continues to be seen at the primary level, the, the very rapid expansion of university systems has led to some real problems of quality. And the most obvious ones are about straining infrastructure, buildings, library and ICT facilities and so forth, lack of lecturers, um, but also aspects such as um, outdated curricula, uh, the difficulties universities have to, to keep up with the changing nature of um, science and technology and other knowledge, um, problems in teaching and learning approaches, and those have translated into concerns with the attributes that graduates are coming out with. So we see employers complaining all the way across the world about the kinds of skills that graduates are coming to them with and so forth. Not always based on a tremendous amount of evidence, but at least that is a, a strong social perception that, that there's, there's an issue with, with learning that takes place in universities. Uh, an associated question of quality, a real challenge that many countries face is, is in the context of very rapidly expanding private sectors in higher education, how to, um, how to regulate, how to ensure quality, um, given that there is such a strong demand for expansion and students will take their, um, will, will invest in their own higher education, families will invest in higher education because there's such a strong emphasis on, on gaining those diplomas and it's, it's hard to ensure uh, consistently high quality across all of those providers. And finally, funding. The pressure of expansion is acute in most countries in higher education and it's extremely difficult to maintain the expense. Um, if, if we try to find cheaper versions of higher education, of course there are some savings to be made through efficiency, but if we push down the costs of higher education too far, it has an inevitable impact on, on quality. Um, at the same time, if we then transfer the costs of higher education entirely to students or, or families, there are obvious implications for equity. So it's very, very hard to, to juggle those three balls. It's, uh, it's, it's a really significant challenge for all countries. There are a range of innovations in relation to higher education to try and address these challenges. And I think, um, as with many of these things, you know, it would be dangerous to, um, you know, to identify a silver bullet that's going to work in all contexts. But um, to give some examples of innovations, uh, one, if we're looking at, at a macro level, the Brazilian government has had a very successful scheme called um, ProUni, or University for All. Now, this is a, it's been very successful. It's also very controversial because it's a, it's a, um, a policy that involves the private sector. Uh, and the, the aim was, through this scheme, to um, ensure that private universities normally are out of reach of many, many people because of the fees that they charge. Um, they would allocate free of charge places to low-income students in exchange for tax breaks from the government. So many of these are for-profit universities, would normally pay taxes. Um, the government excuses them those taxes as long as they allocate a certain number of places to low-income students. In numerical terms, it's been incredibly successful. There have been more than a million students who've gone to university through, <coughs> through this scheme since it was set up in 2004. Of course, it's controversial because some people are concerned about the, um, you know, the fact that many of these private universities have dubious quality, it's hard to regulate, it's hard to ensure that they have, they're actually providing the kinds of learning experience and, and a diploma that will really give them opportunities afterwards. So there are, there are issues and, and concerns, but um, certainly it's, it's a, a very original policy and one that tries to address uh, these dilemmas. If we're thinking of um, other kinds of innovation relating, te relating to teaching and learning. A, a very interesting initiative is seen in, in northern Ghana in the University for Development Studies. Um, based in, in a, um, a predominantly rural region, uh, this university it ensures that all first and second student, first and second year students, regardless of their, the subject that they're studying, do a, a, a couple of months in the summer of a community placement. Um, so they, they leave their classrooms and they go and live in a remote village in a rural area for, for a, a significant period of time. Um, and this is addressing two perennial issues that universities have. First, the big divide between universities and the communities in which they're inserted, which you can see right since the earliest 
European medieval universities. Um, to try and bring students, bring the university into the community to create that kind of dialogue. And this has been um, a very rich experience for students in terms of an intercultural experience. Many of those students who come from urban middle class families and they have a, 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 a very intense experience of, of understanding how other people live and to, to create a dialogue on that basis but also addressing what's perceived to be a real problem in terms of the application of theoretical knowledge to practical issues that universities also face. So these students have to um, work with local communities in addressing some of the issues that they face and develop strategies and implement them and so forth. So that's a, a small scale initiative that's been tremendously successful uh, in a university. Partnerships between universities are also very important, um, whether that's north-south, partnerships, whether it's South-South partnerships. And just an example of, of one of these, May, most of these partnerships, it's true, are of a small scale um, and they have issues of sustainability and so forth. But even some small-scale initiatives ha can have a significant impact. Just to give one example, there was a, a partnership between York St. John's University in the UK and, and a group of universities in Nairobi in Kenya, of small universities, um, which ran an uh, academic staff development program. Uh, and brought together a group of people in, in Kenya who were already very committed to transforming teaching and learning in their institutions. And that partnership which ran this programme led to um, all of those, the, the representatives of those universities developing staff development programmes in their respective institutions um, and allowing many more uh, lecturers to, to engage with those, those courses and transform their practice. And, then led on to the creation of a national association for enhancing teaching and learning, which is trying to campaign on a national level to, to bring changes in that area. So um, that's an example of a, of a successful partnership, which really um, addresses shared interests, commitments, needs on both sides and, and can bring a real impact on practice.